from baby photographs to now I see the hurts, the fear, the confusion And then the anger, the drink, the escape My name is Michael O'Brien. I was one of the, known as one of the Cardiff News Agent Three. I was convicted of murder and robbery in 1987. Ten o'clock at night, October the 12th, 1987. Philip Saunders shuts his small kiosk in Cardiff bus station for the last time. He arrives at his home in Canton, but at the back gate is viciously attacked with a spade and left for dead. It was a ferocious assault, and five days later, Philip Saunders died, unable to identify who had done it. Well, we were three local men who got wrongly convicted of the murder of Philip Saunders in 1987. We were uh, also bludgeoned this, this man to death with a shovel. Uh, it was a brutal attack on this man, um, a brutal murder, and um, it, we were in the wrong place at the wrong time. On the night in question, we were out trying to steal cars, you know, I was trying to fit in and be one of the boys, you know. Um, I'd never been into serious trouble before with the police, well, no trouble before, you know. I was going down the road to criminality, I'm not going to deny that, I think it's, it is fair to say that uh, I was going down them roads. And on the night in question, we did go out to steal a car. I can remember it was wet, it was raining, uh, I mean, uh, I was ill the next day with the flu, I can remember that. And I never thought n nothing of it. The, 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 what happened to Philip Saunders because it didn't mean anything to me. I know that might sound a bit callous, but I didn't know anything about it. I was more concerned about what I had then. I think that's the point. Well, the police come to my house and what they did, they smashed the door down. There was no need for it. You know, we would have answered the door anyway. We were on makeshift beds in my sister-in-law's house in Maitland Place in Cardiff. And um, they said, are you Michael O'Brien? I said, yes. They said, we're arresting you for the murder of Philip Saunders. And I can remember using uh, the language I used was, was, was near enough the specific words I used was, who the fucking hell was Philip Saunders? And that was the exact words I actually used because I thought, who is this guy? I didn't know anything about him, you know, so I was more concerned about the car. So um, I, I, I was just shocked and numb, and I can remember being taken to the police station, and uh, we were held there for three days, in, incommunicado, without any solicitors present. Some of the police officers who arrested us were saying they, we deserved hanging, you know, they, they were saying if the death penalty would have been in, you would have been executed, and rightly so, you know, and uh, the comments they made was just absolutely horrendous, I can remember it as clear as it, it happened yesterday. You know, they also told me that I was going to be bent over the table and shagged up the bum by um, inmates because I was so small and whatever, and uh, they, li they like fresh uh, merchandise, and uh, I, w I would be that merchandise, stuff like that they were saying to me, so it was very, very disturbing. Police said at first that they were looking for a lone attacker. Chief Superintendent Carsley was asked if he was confident of solving the case. I'm always confident, I'm an optimistic person, and I think that uh, with a bit more public help and with the effort put in by my officers on this inquiry, then I'm sure we will be successful. Well, I was a married man at the particular time. I had two children, one on the way, and I had uh, my son Kyle, who was one, and unfortunately for me, uh, we lost our daughter after three months to cot death. When I was on remand, uh, I can remember it, it, it happened um, in March, March the 3rd. I remember a prison um, priest came over to see me and he said to me, I've got a special visit for you. And I thought, oh, maybe they found some new evidence in our case. That's all I was thinking of. I never thought that one of my family would have died. And I went over there and uh, my solicitor was there. He said, I think you want to sit down with what I've got to tell you. And he said, uh, your daughter died this morning. So you can imagine how I felt. I just felt numb and very angry. You know, not only was I wrongfully imprisoned, but I, uh, I had to deal with the death of my daughter. And a few weeks later, it was too much for my wife and she walked out on me. So I'd lost everything I had. I didn't have a lot. I didn't have much money or anything like that. But what I did have was a family unit. And that family unit, you couldn't put a price on.
I was in no fit state for the trial, let alone uh, you know um, anything else. I, I was just in bits, and I was only 19 years of age, and I think people forget that, that I was only a kid. <laughs> The evidence was um, flimsy indeed. There was no forensic evidence linking us to the crime because we didn't do it. Um, all, the only evidence they had was a, an, a police officer on the second arrest. He alleges me and my co-accused whilst we were in the police cells uh, alleged the confession was made and we confessed to the murder, which didn't happen. And the other evidence was all criminals were in serious trouble with the police at the time who then deals with the police to give evidence against us. So they had something to gain. So that, 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 that was the evidence, and obviously uh, there was an inmate on remand who said we confessed to him in the same manner as Stuart Lewis alleges outside the cells, a very similar confession. And this was a person who was on Rule 43, and anybody who knows the prison system will tell you, you can't get near the Rule 43s to confess, because they're, they're, in a, they're kept separate away from the normal location prisoners. So, you know, it was, it, it was impossible to have done this confession. That was it. That was the evidence. And I mean, when you look on it, the confession corroborated the other confession, which corroborated the other confession, which corroborated the other confession. There was no hard evidence whatsoever. In fact, there was evidence to say there was only one person who committed this crime by one of the witnesses. I can remember they were looking for a guy six foot tall, 15 stone build. A neighbour had spotted one man there at the time, and she gave a full description. South Wales Police circulated posters with the description of the suspect the only one to have been seen with Philip Saunders as he was attacked. He was six foot tall, with dark curly hair and a blouse on jacket. There was even a big reward. Now, I might be 15 stone build now, but when I went into prison on my medical records, I was six stone six. So that gives you an idea how small I was and uh, didn't fit the description of the person they were looking for. So, uh, you know, it just goes to show you um, they knew from day one that we didn't do this crime, but they had to have somebody and because my co-accused got a mind of a child, he confessed after 14 interviews and said that he done it, he was the lookout, well then, and me and Ellis Sherwood killed Philip Saunders. And then he changed his statement to say that it was a, a guy called Tony uh, with ginger hair. Well, I don't know when my hair's changed colour overnight or something, and uh, you know, I, I, I've, ch I've changed uh, nationalities or whatever the case may be. But um, you know, he done 14 different statements implicating many other people. And what we didn't know at that particular time was, was that Darren Hall had confessed to a crime he hadn't done before, which was not disclosed to the defence at the time of the trial. Had the jury known that Darren Hall had confessed to a crime he hadn't done at the time of the trial, it would have established everything we said. That he wasn't a full shilling, you know, that was the best way I could describe him, and that he was not a well man. <laughs> Michael O'Brien, you have been found guilty of murder and robbery. A majority of the jury has decided, if I may say so, in my view, rightly decided as they have. I can remember there was a rail like, like this and I remember holding onto the, onto the bars and uh, I nearly collapsed. I can remember my feet going you know, buckling, you know, when they said uh, there's only one sentence we can give you, which is a life sentence for murder. In my opinion, it was a right verdict, and I'm just shocked, and I shouted out, I'm innocent. And I turned to my father and said, Dad, with tears in my eyes, as long as you know I didn't do it, that's all which matters. And um, I was let out of the dock in tears. Uh, just shocked at 19 years of age, 20 years of age, to be found guilty of somebody else's crime. So much like Cardiff Prison, you know, the way, you know, landing one, landing two, landing three, and the nets as well. I never thought I would um, see the inside of a prison uh, again, to be honest. You know, when you've been in prison for 11 years and 43 days, the last thing you want to do is go back into a prison cell. It just brought all the memories flooding back of what it was like at that particular time. So. Yeah, I do feel a little bit shaky, but um, calm about it, you know, knowing that I can walk out the door now and I can actually go home, which I couldn't do before.
I was taken into Cardiff prison, where I stayed there for 16 months altogether, before I was shipped out to a place called Longlat in prison in Eversham, which is probably one of the top security prisons in the country. I mean, nobody's ever escaped from there. I mean, um, you would have thought I was some sort of heavy duty gangster, the way, you know, the, the prisons I'd been in. I mean, uh, it made a mockery of this whole system. You know, there was just little old me, and I knew I didn't do the crime. And I think a lot of prison officers knew I didn't do the crime as well. Well, my introduction to Long Lat in prison was not a pretty sight. I mean, uh, I'll give an example. In the seven years I was there, there were seven inmates who were killed at various stages in my imprisonment there, killed by other inmates. That's how dangerous it was. You had to be on your guard 24 hours a day unless you were locked up. That was the only time you were safe, which is behind your door, because you, I seen people being stabbed, I seen hot water being thrown in people's face with sugar in it, and left scars. I've seen prison officers injured, I've seen other prison officers injured with boiling hot cooking fat, uh, and it all left scars on me. It left some deep, deep scars, which I still, which still remain today. The trauma I suffered, I, I mean, I woke up the one night sweating about three o'clock in the morning and I thought it was a dream, but it wasn't. I woke up and I was actually in prison and it sort of hit home very quickly that this, this was it, this was home. Me and my friends who I thought were my friends and I thought the ones who were coming to see me didn't come in to see me. And I was very disappointed because I, I, I'd known many of these people, grew up with them and everything. And you certainly find out who your friends are when you go into prison and when you're in these positions, when you're in trouble. And I thought my whole world was collapsing and I felt suicidal. I, I, I don't deny that. I, I wanted to kill myself. And, um, I still got some scars on my wrists and my, on my, on, on my hand here where you might clearly see by here the white the white marks of the razor where I uh, tried to harm myself because I was hurting and I wanted the hurt to go away and I thought by cutting myself uh, that was what would happen the hurt would go away I needed help I needed people to listen to me and, and uh, I felt like I was on my own and that was that was uh, the, you know that was the mental state I was in at a particular time I wanted to kill myself I thought I was never going to get out, I didn't know what to do, I didn't know how to fight, I couldn't read or write properly, I just didn't know what to do at all, I mean I was, I was a total mess. There was a turning point for me was, I was on the drugs when I was in prison for two years, the first two years was hell, absolute hell, I, I'm not going to gloss things over, I was taking cocaine, I was taking uh, amphetamines, I was taking whatever I could get my hands on near enough, I was that stoned and drunk and in a mess. And I sat on my bed and I cried. And I cried for one reason, because I knew I needed help. And that was the turning point for me. That's when I started fighting back. And I got help from the prison officers and from uh, the, you know, the psychologists, psychiatrists. And then I said, I got a problem. And I told them I was frank with them. I told them what the problem was. And then I, they started giving me counseling and I started weaning myself off. Well, I used to try and exercise, you know, and I used to, I can remember doing things like this, you know, things like that, just to keep busy, you know what I mean, and doing side bends and stuff like that, getting a broom if you were lucky to have one, to do some twists, and just to keep, try and keep as fit as you can, because if you kept your, yourself fit, you'd kept your mind fit, and that's what we used to do. And uh, I used to do a lot of letter writing as well. I noticed there's no desk in here, but I used to have a little desk and I've got a table and chair, plastic ones, and I used to write all my letters from there. And that's how I started fighting for my freedom, by writing letters in the cells to MPs, journalists, MEPs, peers, everybody I could think of. And when I went to, um, when I got tra transferred up to Long Lat in prison, there was a number of innocent people fighting their cases there, the Birmingham Six, some of the Guildford Four were there, Cardiff Three. I mean, and I found out that I wasn't the only innocent prisoner. I thought I was the only innocent prisoner in the system. I was so naive, it was just beggared belief. And then when I seen all these people fighting their cases, Peter Fell, Michael Shirley, used to protest, hunger strikes, and, you know, prison di in discipline. We used to, you know, go against the governors and the prison officers and wouldn't bang up and things like that. And, um, yeah, we, we all stuck together. And um, I found strength in that. From the maximum security Longlarton jail where he was kept, 
Michael O'Brien has been on hunger strikes to protest his innocence. And that's when I started studying law, educating myself, going to classes, doing things positive, and there was like the dragon just come out of me, you know, the Welsh dragon just sort of, I don't know, it just, I breathed life into myself and I thought, I'm not taking this, I am not accepting this sentence, and I'm going to fight it. And by hell did I fight it, and the prison governors knew they, would, uh, they had a fight on their hands with me. On Wales Tonight, exclusive details of how South Wales Police mishandled a high-profile murder inquiry, an inquiry that left three men in prison for 11 years. Well, according to the Governor and the Home Secretary, prisoners weren't allowed access to journalists, and it was under um, standing order, I think it was 37 at the particular time, where it said uh, visits from journalists a band and I said well that can't be right what about my rights under article 10 the right to free speech and the thing is what people forget is we didn't have no legal aid we didn't have a new solicitor so we had to rely on journalists to find the new evidence to help get us out and what the house of lords basically said was they were trying to um, outlaw the safety valve of overturning wrongful convictions by banning journalists and therefore it was unlawful on that basis alone so, you know, um, I did win my case, but it wasn't without consequences. As I said, uh, they shipped me 300 miles away up to Franklin Prison. My family are from South Wales in Cardiff, so you do the maths and how far that is. It's a six hour journey just to get there, you know, to visit me. So it was very, they made it very, very difficult for me uh, because I dared to challenge them. We proved that the, the police officer had lied in numerous other cases, you know, the confession outside the cells. I didn't know uh, in the case of Anthony Yellen and uh, Sharon uh, Kelleher, he had made confessions up very similar to what he did in our case, and the jury disbelieved him. And only one conclusion could be drawn from that is he lied to the jury. The Welsh conspiracy case played a significant part in our appeal because Inspector Stuart Lewis, the police officer who was involved in my case, actually made up a confession in their case which is so similar and resulted in me taking the South Wales Police Court on evidence of similar fact and I made legal history there where they said I could use it in my civil action against the police as well as use it in my appeal. It was so similar what he'd done in both cases that it was just ironic that somebody who happened to be outside the cells with a piece of paper and a pen and if you try writing on a piece of paper uh, standing up like this the ink would run out I mean, and, there's this th and there were certain words used in the confession. Oh, I may have to tell him what happened. Well, I wasn't very well educated. I come from a place called Ely in Cardiff, which is uh, one of the biggest council estates in Europe. I might have said, oh, you know, why don't you fucking tell him what happened? Do you know what I mean? But I wouldn't have said, oh, I may have tell him what happened. Oh, rather. You know, and I mean, the words, you can tell it wasn't me. You can tell it was the police officers. So the courts, you know, cast serious doubt on his version of events. And I mean, that, that played a significant part. Then there was the Thames Valley Police report which played a significant part. News of that damning report into the way South Wales Police conducted a murder investigation. Tonight, HTV can reveal that officers unlawfully detained suspects and wrongly denied them access to legal advice. Those dramatic findings are contained in a report written by a senior Thames Valley police officer late last year. It could play a key part in the appeal of three men jailed for 11 years for the murder of the Cardiff news agent Philip Saunders. 115 breaches of the Police and Criminal Elevens Act, handcuffed to the radiators, hot radiators were on, denial of food or of water in police stations. These are all basic human rights, which were denied to us in the police station. The Criminal Cases Review Commission referred the case to the Appeal Court for three reasons. A key confession by Darren Hall was probably false. There were questions relating to the evidence of a conversation in which Michael O'Brien and Ellis Sherwood allegedly incriminated themselves. And most damagingly for the police, that there was a systematic disregard of suspects' legal rights. I can remember certain prison officers saying to me, with your attitude, Mike, you're never getting out. So I was told by the probation officer as well that I would never see daylight again unless I admitted my guilt. So I knew I had to fight harder than most prisoners. And that's why I taught myself law. That's why I took the Home Secretary to court to get access to journalists so they could uh, find new evidence in my case. 
everything by accident and design was being done at that particular time because we were getting publicity in the Observer, the Express, the Daily Mirror, the, you know, the Times, the Telegraph, and the prison system cannot cope with people like me, and that was the problem. Well, the way I contacted uh, my lawyers, I, I was lucky because you're entitled to legal phone calls when you're in prison, which is separate to your normal phone calls, especially if you were an appellant, if you had an appeal pending. And every, I think everybody in the prison system knew that uh, the Cardiff News Agent 3 were, you know, were pending an appeal and they were going to fight it. I think everybody knew what I was doing and the work I was doing as well to get that appeal. I mean, even the prison officers knew that. And I've got to be fair to the prison officers. A lot of them did have a lot of sympathy for me, but they couldn't, they couldn't say what they wanted to say because they had to be neutral. And that was the thing. They couldn't be seen to be giving me extra privileges over different other prisoners. But if I needed a legal phone call, and it was a genuine legal phone call, to rectify maybe some documents that the Court of Appeal needed, or uh, the Criminal Cases Review Commission, they would let me allow, they would allow me to have that phone call, and it would be at the public's expense. So, uh, yes, I, I'm very grateful for some of the prison officers who did that. There are some good prison officers in prisons. one prison officer who we didn't get on you know we probably would have in normal circumstances but there was always the fact that I was innocent and they couldn't do anything with me and they were dishing out tellies at the particular time and I said he said to me the officer well you're not getting the telly Brian you're always naughty you know you never behave yourself and I said well I'll buy my own fucking tellies when I get out in a few weeks time and uh, anyway uh, I knew I was going for bail because we had all the new evidence at that particular time from the CCRC and an outside police force so what actually happened then, the 21st of December, which happened to be my daughter's anniversary, you know, birthday, the one who died, I heard on Radio 5 Live, I was going home in the morning. I was lying on my bunk and I just flew off my bunk and started banging my door. And everybody else started banging their door and it was like, euphoria broke out. And the last, the last person I seen on my way out to that prison that day was that prison officer who refused to give me a telly. And I said, I told you I could buy my own fucking tellies, didn't I? And you couldn't, have write, you couldn't have wrote the script for it. It was absolutely poetry in motion. And I just walked out of the prison with a big grin on my face to be greeted by my son and the media. And that was the road to my freedom. Um, when I did come out, a lot of people who were my friends all those years ago did come to my house and gave me uh, their phone numbers, but I just put them in the bin, and I've done so for a reason, because they didn't have time for me when I was in prison, so why should I have time for them now? I needed their help, and I feel some of them let me down, and sadly, you know, that's the way it is, that's the way I saw it. One thing I noticed when I was in prison, I didn't, I didn't have a mental illness before I went in there, but I certainly came out with post-traumatic stress disorder when I came out of there. And I do feel, it doesn't matter whether you're innocent or guilty, I still feel prison is a traumatic place for anybody. And I think we've got to bear that in mind, the damage it does. There's no doubt in my mind, had the death penalty been in been in in 1987 that I would have been executed, my co-accused would have been executed and many other victims of miscarriages of justice would also be executed and this is the reason why we can never ever ever bring the death penalty back into this country because you know it's not worth one innocent person's life because once the deed is done you can never ever take that back. The tra traumatic event I went through then is still with me, you know, today. I I've left prison, but prison will never leave me, and I think that's the key as well. I had a rainbow above my head I wasn't ostracised, but had kindness instead The cry